But so, uh, what is it, 70 plus percent of the planet is covered in water, and we've only explored about 3% of that entity. Um, the bulk of the planet is beetles. Go figure. Dark matter rules in space. We don't know very much. And here's another realm of the peculiar. Marlene Zuck, she um, researches insect sex. And she says, as someone who works on sexual behavior in animals, I've grown used to getting a lot of off-the-wall questions about curi from curious members of the general public. Topping the list is homosexuality and whether it occurs in species other than our own. And another inexplicably popular area of inquiry is whether animals exhibit oral sex. <laughs> How would you know in the case of beetles? <laughs> and is there any cure for this infestation <laughs> along the lines of sex? Is that a way that we might possibly stop them? Well, thank you. It turns out that people are more afraid of insects than they are of dying, at least if you want to believe a 1973 survey that was published in the Book of Lists. Uh, public speaking and uh, heights came in as the first two, but then right after that was insects. Uh, death was uh, number six. I think if you put spiders in with insects and ask people about fear of the multi-legged, that would have topped, absolutely, number one, no question, in terms of people's fears. At the same time, we're all really fascinated by insects. And scientists have been using insects for centuries to try and understand the answers to life's biggest questions. Some of the greatest minds on Earth, from Jean-Henri Fabre to Charles Darwin to E.O. Wilson, have focused their attention on some of the smallest minds to try to figure out the way the world works. Now, what is it about insects that does this to us? Why do we keep coming back to them? Some of it, of course, is their sheer numbers. Um, as you've heard before, they form the majority of species on Earth. Uh, there are, in fact, between one and 10 million different kinds of insects. It depends who you ask and how they figure it out. Um, to try and put this in perspective, if you wanted to have an insect of the month calendar and not repeat a species every month, uh, you could go on for 80,000 years and do that, and you'd never have to repeat. You know, take that, pandas and kittens. You know, this, this is really quite an accomplishment. And so insects are really important, but at the same time, the reason I keep coming back to them and the reason I like studying them is something that I think is more profound, and that's that insects show us a different way of life. In a sense, they break all the rules that we have about the way we think things are supposed to work. And there's no place where that's clearer than in matters pertaining to sex. And so here, this is the message. Actually, if you don't take anything else from my talk, you should take this one. Sex in insects is more interesting than sex in people. And I stand with that even with some of the information that we've heard earlier this afternoon. <laughs> Stay with me. Once you understand about sex in insects, Sex in people just seems kind of stereotyped and pedestrian and boring. Again, I am standing with that, even with the information we heard earlier. For one thing, the first rule we all learned about sex is that it's what you have to do in order to make babies. But as you heard in the film, there are insects that can reproduce without sex. They break that rule right away. The aphids that are on your rose bushes right now are busily popping out baby aphids without the benefit of having mated. Virgin birth, right there, in your garden, at this very moment. <laughs> the social insects, the bees, the wasps, and ants, are a little bit more cavalier about mating and using sperm. The queen, who produces all of the other uh, members of the colony, will have sex and use uh, fertilized eggs, uh, use the sperm to produce daughters, but then she makes sons without the benefit of sperm at all. And speaking of sperm, 
Now, male insects, like these horned beetles, will use weapons to fight with each other for access to females, which is true for a lot of animals, it's like antlers on deer um, or you know, something like that. But long after the mating has occurred, or sometimes right at the moment of mating, the fighting continues. Because insects compete with each other, not just physically before mating, but with their sperm. And I have to say that, you know, I, I heard the talk earlier, mammals are just chumps when it comes to sperm competition. The real champions of sperm competition are the insects. There are some species of fruit flies that have individual sperm cells that are longer than their own bodies. You can see here uh, six of them coiled up next to the uh, egg just to get an idea of the relative size. And the testis of these male fruit flies, this is one uncoiled here next to uh, his body, is more than 10% of his body weight. I will pause briefly and allow you to do the math and imagine what that would mean if for a human male, 10% body, okay, yeah, you guys are good at math, okay. Um, so what that tells you is that for insects, investment in sperm is a really big deal. And it's a really big deal because sperm competition is extremely common. And sperm competition occurs in a couple of ways. In damselflies and many other insects, males use their genitalia like a, a shovel to scoop out the sperm of previous mates and replace it with their own. And so the, the penis, which is shown in the bottom part of the slide here, looks kind of almost like a Swiss army knife with all the attachments pulled out. But what it's, and what it's used for is to scoop out the sperm from previous mates. And so, you know, ladies and gentlemen, you know, this is a penis. I, the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the <laughs> statement earlier about, you know, the formation of the human, really boring. Uh, in other insects, instead of uh, doing this mechanically, the sperm themselves will compete inside the body of the female long after mating has happened. Another place that insects really break the rules is when it comes to our preconceived notions about so-called natural biological sex roles. A lot of people think that animals, insects included, have this very kind of 1950s sitcom sex role style. Uh, so that males are always dominant, females are always subordinate, and so when humans try and do something a little bit different than that, it's viewed as being a little bit unnatural. But in fact, there's all kinds of things that are natural, and no place shows that better than the insects. In katydids, which are insects that are related to crickets and grasshoppers, the males produce, along with sperm, these globby, nutritive objects that the female consumes either during or right after mating. These can represent up to 30% of the male's body weight. Again, I will pause briefly. Every time you or a male partner had sex, 30% body weight. Wow, nobody's even laughing. Um, <laughs> so the females consume these, they're nutritive, they help her lay more eggs. But as you might imagine, if you had to lose 30% of your body weight every time you had sex, you would not be having sex all that often and you'd be really picky about who you had it with. And indeed, that's true. See, the female katydids gain by mating with as many males as possible, because the more males they mate with, the more of these nutritive substances they're going to be able to consume and the more eggs they can lay. The males, on the other hand, gain by being very picky about who they're going to mate with, because they're not going to be able to produce many of these objects in their lifetime. So what they prefer are females that are big and fat because those females are likely to lay more eggs and hence give more of a return on the male's investment by producing more eggs that are fertilized with his sperm. Insects are also, contrary to popular belief, really good parents. And here's also, I'm also showing a spider in the lower part of the slide because she's just so cute carrying around her babies on her back. Um, the male, uh, the uh, insect at the top of the slide is a male giant water bug. And he takes the eggs that are laid on his back by the female, he fertilizes them with his sperm, and then he swims around with them in the pond or stream, and they're heavy, I mean, it's a big deal carrying them around. Uh, so he swims around with them, even after they hatch, he takes care of them, he provides a really extended period of parental care, which is not something we tend to associate with insects. 
Now, that's interesting for two reasons. One of them is that, look at this, single dads, perfectly natural all over the animal kingdom. The other thing, though, is that we often say in humans that the reason we have long periods of childhood and dependency and you know, kids needing college funds and you have to spend forever with them and they take two parents and it's a huge amount of work is that, well, we're so intelligent, we have such big brains that obviously children need a long time and a lot of investment in order to get to function in our complex society. Well. I mean, I love water bugs, but even I am not going to argue that they're, you know, candidates for Mensa or that their societies are particularly complex, and yet they have extended periods of parental care. So what insects can help us do is question what it, some of our assumptions about, in this case, what parental care is really all about. But there's no place where our assumptions get challenged more when it, about, with insects than when it comes to the sex of social insects. Now, some of you may remember Bee Movie from a few years ago in which Jerry Seinfeld played a slacker worker honeybee who was seeking to escape the tedium of the hive or factory. Now, whatever else you might think about Jerry Seinfeld, it is absolutely undeniable that he makes a terrible worker honeybee. Uh, not because of any of his talents, but because all worker honeybees all of the bees you see flitting from flower to flower, gathering nectar, going back to the hive. All of the worker ants that you see going across your kitchen counter or into the sugar bowl or whatever, all of them, all of them, every single one is a female. There are no worker male social insects. Now, this is a mistake that, you know, thinking that, that the workers that you see are, are uh, male is a mistake that turns out to have a very long history. For centuries, people thought that the social insects were male-dominated. The ancient Arabs and Greeks referred to a bee king or a bee father as being in charge of the colony. The Greeks assumed that because the workers have stingers, that meant that they had weapons, and so of course they must be male because you know, females wouldn't have weapons. Uh, the Arabs kind of viewed the whole system uh, like it was a giant military, so there were generals and other officers, and then again the soldiers with the weapons, and of course everybody was male. Uh, uh, Aristotle was very puzzled by the whole thing because he knew that in addition to the workers and the, what we now know as the queen or the, the leader in any event, uh, there were drones. And so those are actually, as it turns out, the males, but he, he saw that there was this other group of bees in the hive, but he couldn't figure out how this would all work because if the workers with their weapons were female, or sorry, were male, and then they came back to the hive and the drones were just kind of lying around doing nothing while the workers continued to do all the work and take care of the offspring. Well, that didn't seem very masculine. But then that would mean that the drone, anyway, he just got utterly confused. At one point he threw up his hands and said, maybe the sex organs of both sexes were present in a single bee. Uh, that's actually also not true. Um, it took until, in fact, the late 1600s for a Dutch scientist, Jan Swammerdam, to determine that, in fact, there are three classes of honeybees, the workers and the queens, which are both female, the queen does all the reproducing, and the drones, and the drones are male. They exist for a very short period of time. They leave the nest, they fly in search of a virgin queen to mate with. If the, I always tell my students, if they're... Uh, the drone is really lucky, he finds a virgin queen, mates with her, immediately on mating, his genitalia explode, he falls to the ground and dies. Um, and I always point out that this is the best possible outcome uh, for him, because of course the alternative is he just dies anyway after a couple of days and you know, will not have left any genes in the next generation. I'm, I've never been, I don't think my students ever really believe that, but, uh, but it, it really is true. So people have told a lot of stories about honeybees and a lot of, um, cultures and groups have held them up as models because of their cooperation, their industriousness. The Masons, the Mormons um, have all used uh, hives as symbols. For a little while, um, the uh, uh, the Victorians uh, in England knew that uh, they did figure out that the workers were female and they knew they didn't uh, reproduce and so the uh, worker honeybees were held up as an example for young women because of their chastity. Um, although I'm not sure that ever really worked out as much of an inspiration. Uh, and despite this though, I found that people, a lot of people really have not gotten the memo about this. And that includes my students. And I want to read you just a very brief snippet from my book, Sex on Six Legs, 
about uh, an exchange that I've uh, had about social insects and their sex. So after my lecture on army ants, which are the legendary voracious consumers of everything in their path, a typical exchange with a student will go as follows. So, Dr. Zook, you, you know about the ants? What about them? Like, you said all the workers were female, but what about the army ants? Their workers are female too. Yeah, but what about the soldiers, the ones you said have those huge jaws and everything? They're female too. So really, the soldiers? The soldiers are female? Really? At that point, the student usually slouches off, eyeing me skeptically. I always feel like I've let them down, but it's not really clear how. So, okay. I mean, a lot of people make mistakes about this. Obviously, there are um, you know, still more films that make this egregious error. And so seriously, it is not his day. It's her day. How hard is this? People really should be getting it right. I mean, at the same time, you know, people sometimes, I know I have a thing about this, and people sometimes will say, you know, come on, students make all kinds of mistakes. Uh, you know, you're always reading about polls in which students, you know, don't know where Afghanistan is, or they think World War II was fought in the 1600s. But, uh, you know, there are mistakes, and then there are mistakes. And I think the problem with the mistake about social insects is that if you ignore how different insects are from us, if you ignore that their societies are female-dominated, it means that you're missing out on some of what's natural in life, and you're missing out on some of the possibilities. So what do we take, then, from insects? I think sometimes they offer us a mirror of our own behavior. They do things that are a lot like what we do. They build complex structures. They communicate using symbols. They raise their offspring for long periods of time. And yet they do that in vastly different ways from us because they lack our big brains. They don't have a cerebrum, they don't have a cerebellum, they don't have the right and left hemispheres. And so they show us that you don't need a big brain to do big things. Other times, instead of being a mirror of what we do, they offer us a glimpse into something completely different. There are moths and butterflies that can see colors we can't because they can look into the ultraviolet. They let us see what life is like with different rules. And most of all for me, I like insects because they're so hard to identify with. Unlike our pets, we can't look at them and think of them like little people in fursuits. They seem really alien to us, and I think that's a good thing because it makes us see that all of life is not the way that humans are. So I think that insects really show us another way to do things, another way that's natural, that's normal, and in doing so, I think the insects really show us a lot about what it means to be human. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's lovely, Mallory.